got Corey Thrush once again going back to module three for us. Um, so thanks a lot, Corey. Yep. Thank you. All right, module three, how to execute a Bayesian analysis. And this may quell some of the questions that were asked previously of, well, you're talking about distributions. Where are the distributions at? And I think this will answer that. Um, so how to execute Bayesian analysis, uh, the objectives, summarize how to use a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, to obtain that posterior. Could do the math, or you could use the computer. Um, and then to explain the purpose of an MCMC. So what is it trying to do? Uh, describe how it works. Um, and a lot, so, okay, it's fine and well that you got the MC, MC to work, but how is it good? So we can analyze some diagnostics to see, okay, well, is it on the right track or is it off the trail per se? And then you should, by the end of this, be able to duplicate our RJAG code snippets by yourself. So Bayesian analysis. I talked about the posterior being the basis of Bayesian analysis. I call it the big kahuna because it's what we want. It's necessary. So we saw that graph previously. So obtaining a posterior. So we can do the math, but you have to do calculus to obtain the posterior, and there's multiple parameters often. So then there's multiple parameters involve integrals that don't have a closed form, a.k.a. they don't integrate to one, so they're not a valid uh, probability distribution function. And uh, you could also have posteriors that are not recognizable or name distribution. So even if you wanted to use conjugate or maybe off the tracks, but there's not like a quick fix trick or whatever when you use conjugate priors. Uh, so, well, and you'll see an example of that uh, in the first coding example of using a conjugate prior and what that means. Now there are numerical approximations, uh, recognizable distributions. Uh, within the Monte Carlo methods, there's acceptance rejection sampling, important sampling, and many, many more. A lot of them. And then the more typically used ones are the MCMC methods, uh, the Gibbs sampler, the Metropolis within Gibbs sampler, and there's a myriad of other ones, and we'll talk about uh, four of them today. So why do we like MCMC? Because of these two properties. Uh, each draw from an MCMC relies only on the previous draw. And then once you are in the posterior distribution, you are guaranteed to continue sample, sampling or drawing from the posterior distribution. You can understand why those two uh, reasons are good. Because if, if you're drawing out of the distribution, then why are you simulating it? Or you got to steer it back on its track. So that's why... Uh, one of many reasons why an MCMC method would be used. So you may be wondering, okay, well, how does an MCMC method work at all? And here's some intuition behind it. A king named King Markov has to visit each of his islands of his kingdom proportionally to the size of the island. So as you can see, Island one's the smallest, so he should be visiting that one the, the least amount. Two, second most, three, and so on. So he should be visiting island five the most. Well, he's he lives by the moment, so he doesn't like plans. He just wants to go with the flow. Well, luckily, he's got very smart advisors to plan for that. <laughs> so... They have a two-step plan where they propose which island they go to with a coin. So I think uh, if he's on island three, because that's his favorite right now, he'll propose with a coin flip, hey, island two is heads and island four is tails. But that's not actually moving. That's just, hey, 
if we're going to move, this is what we're proposing, and then we'll compute a ratio for acceptance or actually moving to that island. But I do want to reiterate, uh, talking about the proposal and acceptances, it is possible that he's on island three, he's proposed to go to island two, and he stays on island three. So that's where all the self loops come in from. So it is possible to stay on the island. Any questions about that so far? Pretty straightforward. All right. So I lied, his favorite island is number two. So the first step is a proposal. His advisors, hey, island one or island three, let's flip a coin. And it just so happened to come up as island three. Well, what does that mean when computing a ratio? Because uh, he has to visit his islands proportionally. Now, uh, since island three is bigger, he is definitely moving to island three from island two, right? And uh, where some funky math notation comes in is the minimum. Well, you can't have a probability greater than one. So it's the minimum of the ratio of the areas of the island or one. And in this case, island three is bigger. So it's with one probability that he's moving to island three. And also I should note, there's a 0% chance that he stays on island two, right? Because it's bigger. So another proposal. So his advisors flip a coin again. So you can go to island two or island three. They flipped, lands heads for island two. Well now, with the probability of moving to island two, is now two thirds. Because the ratio of the, the islands, island two is about two thirds the size of island three. So there's a one third chance of King Markov staying on island three and two thirds of a chance of going to island two. And let's just assume he goes to island two or back to island two. So remember he has to visit them purport, the islands proportionally to the size, uh, proportional to the size of the island. And this is the true proportion of days he should stay on an island. So every time there was like a move or a stay, I, he stayed there for a day. I forgot to mention that. So again, uh, reiterating, so island one should be the smallest and island five should be the biggest, increasing as you increase the number of the island. So what's it look like after three days? So I showed you through three days. So day one, he stayed on island two. He moved to island three on day two. And then he's back to island two on day three. So on the left is what we call a trace plot. And it's just basically the history of where your algorithm has explored. And then you can see on the right, those proportions are nowhere near what they need to, or they're not representative of the true proportions that I showed you at the last slide. Because island one's not up there, island four is not visited yet, and island five's not up there yet. Any questions about that so far? All right. So let's just say we're checking on his progress in 20 days. And again, shows he stayed on island two the first day, moved to island three, back to island two. And then you may notice like the sharp, or the sharp steep curve where it looks like he jumped from island two to island four. You cannot do that, remember. He's got to move adjacently. So he's, in order to get from island two to island four, he's got to go from island two to island three to island four in those two uh, days. So the, the plot is a little bit misleading, but just wanted to point it out that he's not moving to an island bigger than, or 
not adjacent to the one that he's on in one day. And then you can see the histogram on the right is getting better, where two is smaller than three and three is smaller than four. However, island one hasn't been visited yet, and island five isn't the largest uh, bar on the histogram yet. And then after 100 days, I'm not going to talk about his adventures, but you can uh, see in the trace plot, he tends to stay uh, on those islands higher numbered. So your island three, island four, island five, just looking at the trace plot. And you can also uh, see it in the bar chart. It's approaching what should be the true proportion. But as you can tell, it's not super close yet because island three is much, much smaller than island four. And so there should be a little bit of decrease on Island 4 and Island 5. So any questions about King Markov's trip? All right. So... Did you have a question? I, oh, I saw your hand go up. There's seven steps in an MCMC -MC sampler. So first you have the sampler set up, and then within that you load your R packages. In our case today, it'll be R JAGs, and maybe some other libraries. I don't think we need any others, but R JAGs is the primary one, but there's other packages that are more helpful for Bayesian analysis. And then you set your directory, so where do you want to store the information, the data, your results. And setting the burn-in and iterates. So remember King Markov, even through 100 days, it wasn't representative of the true proportion yet. So maybe we wanted to, if we over the long run, we wanted to get a true proportion, but we just discounted the first 20 or 40 days to let them explore and then he gets in the MC or in the posterior distribution of what it should be. So that's what a burn-in is. And then the iterates is the number of days we want to let King Markov adventure. Does, uh, do those two things make sense? Okay. Now we need to create or read in data. And in our example today, we just uh, read in a CSV file, but you can use text, notebooks, and stuff like that. So it, it can be difficult. But then you have to create a list for parameters, the things that you want to uh, estimate, and initialize those parameters. So uh, in King Markov's case, we initialized the, the parameter at island 2. Well, maybe we should have had them start at island 5. And then uh, define the model. You'll see what this is, but essentially, well, what's the likelihood function? So what is the data you're trying to collect? Run the sampler. Check the diagnostic. So we saw a couple of them in the trace plots and the histograms. And then conduct inference. But that won't be, we'll get the numbers and the estimates and all that stuff, but Inference is more of like an interpretation and analysis combination. So that'll be talked about more in module four. And then again, another shout out to JAGS. Uh, you can download it using that link. It uses the bugs modeling language. And I can't think of what bugs stands for right now off the top of my head. Major Seek, do you remember? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, Yes, but JAG stands for just another Gibbs sampler. I think bugs is Bayesian equivalent of Gibbs sampler. Yes, yes. And uh, JAGs can be put on multiple platforms. We as institutions just like to use R, at least I do. So we're using it in R today. And then here's uh maybe a downfall but maybe you like having more control and not clicky clacking through a graphical user interface but it's platform independent but there is no gui uh while some other sampling packages do have that uh 
I'll say our stand, but the joke is good luck installing it because you need a computer science degree to essentially figure that stuff out. <sighs> Spent many hours trying to do that. Okay, and then uh, so the various packages. So today we'll be using our Jags. So thinking about a simple example for our Jags. So let's assume your friend finds a jagged coin in his, big, in his piggy bank, and he wants to know the probability of it landing heads. So it's jagged. What would you think? So are you going to pick a uniform prior where it's going to be equally likely for all uh, probabilities of uh, landing heads? Is it going to be fair? Or are you going to have it slightly different because it is jagged? Oh, well, it's jagged on, there's a cut on this side, so there's less material on the head side, so I expect it to land on the tail side more. I don't know. Uh, so some group think, what would you guys do? <laughs> hey, he just found he just found it in his piggy bank. He he's never messed with it before. You have no idea what it's doing. But you know some information about other coins. Or maybe you're you have a PhD in physics, so you know, hey, it's going to tend to land on this side more. So any guesses? Okay, I like that idea, but how much uh, how much information or how much belief do you have in that? A lot, a little. Okay, yeah. Hey, all righty. So this is uh, I'll be flipping back and forth. So uh, to discredit me right off the bat, uh, it says set a seed. So usually when you're doing numerical approximation. You set a seed before it all. But our JAGS is weird where you have to uh, actually set the seed within the sampling method or the object down below. Didn't know that until like a couple weeks ago. So our uh, estimates may be a little different, but they should be relatively the same. So that's not that big of an, uh, a deal anymore, setting the seed there. Um, can everyone see the font size fine, or do you want it larger? Ooh. Any of those working for you? I know it's white and black, but... Okay. So in R, to install package, if you're in R Studio, you can go up here to Tools, Install Packages, or you can just do it in your editor, install.packages, and then specify the name of the package you want to download. Since I already have those downloaded, uh, two libraries, our two packages I need are Coda and RJAGS. So this is step one, setting up the sampler. Now here's a little extra stuff that we typically won't do in terms of the steps, but we talked about prior selection. So here's a uniform prior, but I don't think we agreed on that as someone L said, no, let's center at 0.5. So this is where I was asking how much belief that we want to put into the jagged coin of it being fair. So what about this one? Since there's a little bit of variance or any diff modifications to that, or is this pretty good? where it's not too 
Um, too skinny. It's pretty diffuse where it allows the data to talk a little bit. Yes, so good point. Uh, so in this case, we're using a conjugate prior with a beta distribution as our prior. So there's a, just so happened to have a great practical interpretation of this. So uh, we have two parameters, A and B, and a beta distribution. So this is like seeing a, like we did four flips of a coin and we saw two heads and two tails. So that's why it's centered at 0.5. But did you say 4.3? Okay. So now it's like you saw seven tosses beforehand, but it's uh, on the, the probability of heads is greater than 0.5 now. I'd say it's centered around 0.6. A little bit below that. Well, yes, but <laughs> we're not worried about that right now. We're, we're live demoing. So, I don't know. Well, I'd hate to say it, but you ruined the demo. Because <laughs> we decided that we're going to flip it 20 times, and our results were... 13 heads and seven tails. So your prior was closer to what the data was saying than what our fair prior, oops, sorry, our fair prior earlier was saying of the beta 2 2. Um, <laughs> you're the man. So, what does your posterior look like? Great question. Let's use our JAGs to do that. So uh, since we're using conjugate priors, we could uh, do like the quick tricks of uh, getting out the back end. Hey, well, I know it's this formula, so A plus B plus uh, for the A parameter. I'm going off script here, but there are like quick tricks that we can do when using conjugate and since it's a simple example. However, how often is life simple? Never, so uh, rather than like graduate to the effectiveness example, I'm using this to illustrate oh, like the simple steps that we have to do every time. So again, we're still in step one. And how many edits do we wanna use? I just shot for 10,000. And then uh, what's the number of burn-ins? So how many days do we want to let King Markov enjoy life exploring until he's actually in the posterior? Well, sorry, King Markov. Your, your adventures are being cut shorter where you're actually going to have to do some more work. So we're going to now do a burn-in of, of 1,000. So we finished step one. Now, step two, I talked about a CSV file, but that's for the next example. In this case, we can just create like list objects where the number of successes we saw was 13. So think of that, the number of heads we saw. And we'll label that Y. And then what's the total number of flips that we did in our experiment? It was 20. Now step three, what are we trying to estimate or what parameter? So we created a parameter list and we wanna estimate theta or a probability of uh, flipping heads. And then define the data so we read it in but now we have to put in an actual list. So now uh, we have the data set defined and then this is uh, 
there's not like an exact science behind the initialization of starting a, a parameter, but maybe starting at a 0.5 is a good idea because we thought it was fair. Assuming that we uh, didn't use the data, uh, know about much of the data. So we're gonna initialize it here where it's a fair coin. Now, uh, part four, so this syntax is used to translate to, like communicates to bugs and then back to our R of what our Bayesian model is. So our model is, well, we have a likelihood that's binomial and we wanna estimate theta out of the N samples that we had. But our prior is, we're still estimating for, uh, still wanna estimate theta and we're saying, oh, it's fair. So we saw two heads and two tails, idealistically, before the test. So now we define the model. Now we have to create an object representing our Bayesian model, so it's interpreting bugs back to us. So this is where the jags.model function comes in. So our model is initialized because it wasn't too complex or too complicated of a model. And then this next line of code actually samples from our posterior now. So I uh, just want to talk about this a little bit more. Our parameters is just our theta that we're interested in. Our iterates, we set that up in uh, step one, which is 10,000. Our burn-in was 1,000. And I won't spoil the news on thin yet, but. So now actually sampling it, we can look at our diagnostics after the sampler did its thing. And this is just uh, an option to see more decimals. Not uh, super useful, but maybe. And then here's what our, our, our simulation is telling us. So looking at iterations 1001 through 11,000, so our sample size is 10,000 for this model. Our mean is about 0.62. So that would be our estimate for the probability of heads in this situation. And then you may be wondering what SD means. Well, because it's a distribution on the parameter, it is actually a standard deviation, not the standard error. And then also, with these being smaller than the standard deviation, the naive SE and the time series SE being smaller than the standard deviation, that tells us good. It was exploring uh, the posterior appropriately. And then here's some quantiles uh, for our distribution. So two and a half percentile was around 0.42 and 9.8 and so on. And I talked about trace plots. Well, where did our algorithm go? And so in the King Markov example, you could see relatively where he went even up to 100 days. Well, now it looks like just nothing, but we're in a good spot because uh, we like to have this fuzzy caterpillar. So it's not like diverging. You see it's like all centered around where you would consider a line right here around our mean. And then the density or the distribution of just the parameter theta we can see is right here on our right. All right, any questions about that? Yes. Can you explain again what the interpretation of the standard error 
terms is it's not the posterior standard deviation of the parameter of right? oh v is like the naive standard error and uh i don't know exactly what it is but like the smaller the better i think it's more of just in terms of your iterations per it's not jumping all the way this way or that way does that make sense so it's a characteristic of how your sampler is behaving, I guess? Yeah, one of okay. the ways. So one of many diagnostics you could also include, but we don't talk about those, but the smaller those are, you're in a good in good shape. Okay, thanks. Yep, thank you. All right. Any other questions? So now you should know how to do R JAGs in a complicated example for M2A2 now, hopefully. We have the general steps. Uh, so. All right, we can uh, switch back now. So I guess I'm curious, like, if you saw a uh, a non-fuzzy caterpillar, what you would do? <laughs> Great question. Um, so there's quite a few different things that you could do. Longer burn-in period, set a different initialization where, hey, maybe it wasn't actually, like, let's just say we started at point 0.1, and it just kept exploring, and it didn't go above 0.5, but we know it should have been, in this simple example, it should have been above 0.5. Um, so those are two of the more s simple ways of fixing it. I'm sure there's many other ways, but those are like the two quick hitters that I would, I would look at first. Just to make sure I understand this one. In the end, with your fuzzy caterpillar in the mean line, it was about 0. 0.63. Yes, So correct. this coin was not fair. Yes, correct. It turns out your prior with a, a 13.7 result. Uh, well, that wasn't the, that's, decided to flip 20 times, that's our experimental data. But our prior could have been our uniform or the, right. yep. But your experiment, it turns out that your 20 isn't bad. Yes. But if you've ever flipped coins, I'm sort of like, I sort of feel like that's telling me nothing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is just uh, to illustrate a simple example. But I mean, you could think about it in like experimental design and costly testing. I mean, hey, maybe a fair prior with not a lot of information in it gave us a head start so we're not gaining all that information to get up to 0.63, right? Maybe we're kind of giving it a head start and then letting it. I guess my point is, had it been seven heads and 13 tails, you could just as easily have gotten the 0.63 for heads. This, the, the fact that this is 13.7 oh, yeah, of the binomial, really has yes, no correct, impact on likely. the answer. Yes. Okay, because it kind of, by seeing that and seeing the answer, it looks like there's a relationship between them. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the message here is that really has, has yeah, that was in the burn-in. That that really ultimately had nothing to do well, with the answer. Well, no, no, because a burn-in, this data was a data model already, like, we have our function in the background that we're simulating from. So we let the uh, algorithm explore a little bit, and then we said, okay, well, 10,000 iterates, that should give us a good sample. So the 20... And uh, four, let's just say, for the prior isn't exactly not representative. Because there's two things. There's simulation steps and the data information steps. Does that make sense? Okay, maybe I should back it up to a question. Uh, Did I you maybe, expect, based on the 13 and 7, that your final answer was going to be similar to that? Yes, to the 0.63, because we, weren't, we didn't have a strong prior. We only had information on four flips.
So we let more of the data do talking, right? This is going back to the prior where, hey, we don't want to put too much information where testing is irrelevant, but we want to have a decent prior of information gain. Because we knew, hey, uh, coins tend to be, there's variations in them, but tend to be around 0.5 for probability of heads. Um, however, this ca this case, it just so happened to be jagged, and it landed on 13 heads and out of 20 trials. Okay. Maybe we'll we'll go back to that question later. Yes, I got you. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm understanding the simulation steps right. So, um, your posterior is always being recalculated, right? And your posterior becomes your prior. You're sampling from a posterior. Yes, yeah, so the simulation, you're sampling from your posterior. Uh, and then what was the question before that? Yeah, no, I'm just trying to understand the simulation step. So you get your, you have your prior, you have your data. Yeah. You get a posterior distribution. Yep. And then you just keep sampling from that. Correct. So there's some function in the background that your computer is estimating or sampling from. So that's the whole, uh, the point of doing simulations. Because we, maybe, we just so happen to use a conjugate prior. But what if I wanted to do, I don't know, a normal prior and, well, the data model was binomial. Well, you're not going to have a quick and easy trick. So the, the prior multiplied by the likelihood function, there is some function or distribution that the computer can estimate uh, or sample from, not estimate. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then once, you get your, once you're sampling from your posterior distribution, then from that you can get... That's where your point estimates come in. So like that 0.63... That would be your estimate for the probability of heads for this jagged coin. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. sweet. All right. Uh, do we want to take a quick break right now? It's about 40 minutes in, but and then kind of power through the rest of this module, or do we want to do a little bit more? Major C, Corey, keep going? Okay. So the first, uh, well, this algorithm should seem familiar, uh, just not in the context of King Markov. So we can randomly select an X sub zero, or we can uh, uh, cho cho uh, choose it or initialize it. So there's X sub zero. And this curve right here is our posterior. So you remember in the King Markov example, there was that proposal versus acceptance. Well, we can draw a normal distribution on this posterior now, where x0 is the mean, and our standard deviation is some step size uh, we choose. And so the standard deviation sets the normal distribution, right? So we can randomly generate from this normal distribution. So our star is what we sampled. Now we have to calculate the ratio like we did in the King Markov example. Well, I'll point it out. Sorry, never mind. Uh, so the star to the left, the, uh, the posterior distribution is higher then our x sub zero point on the posterior. So our ratio of moving from x sub zero to the star, the proposed value, the probability of moving to it is one because it's higher, remember? So, uh, and then we, we talked about this criteria. If some value is less than or equal to a ratio, so we would sample from a uniform zero to one. So that ratio we can think of, so let me backtrack to the King Markov example. So this one, we're definitely moving up. But remember the going from island three to island two, the ratio is two thirds. 
So we set a breakpoint in our uniform distribution where we're sampling from just once, where, hey, if it's below two thirds, we're moving the island two. And if it's above two thirds, we're staying on island three. Does that make sense in terms of where the uniform? And if you need me to uh, repeat it, I can do that. So it just so happened in this case, we moved to the left where the posterior distribution was higher, so we're definitely moving to that next spot. So now we have an X sub one, our proposal is centered at X sub one, and our standard deviation is whatever step size we chose. And then we repeat from step two, and here's where the interactive part comes in. So we're at step one where we created or we initialized uh, where we want to be in the posterior. What is the next step? So think King Markov, his advisors, there was a proposal and acceptance. What's between those two, what's the answer? You're you're my guy, so I'm calling on you. Um, so have we already done our proposal? Not yet. We just initialized. So what's our next step? Yeah, we, we did the Correct. So there's our proposal, the normal distribution. Where is it centered at? Exactly. So it's centered at X zero or wherever we initialized. All right. Anyone? Uh, so another uh, member from the audience, what's the next step? So we created the proposal. Now we actually have to randomly generate from the normal distribution. I gave you the answer there. So we're, uh, we're at the star. So what's next in the algorithm? Exactly. So it's calculate the acceptance ratio. And in this case, what does it happen to be? Since it's higher, it's got to be a probability of. Yes, that's a probability of one. So. And then repeat from step two. All right. So what we actually used for our JAGS is the Gibbs sampling algorithm. This first assumption, you're going to say, well, what the heck? We didn't do that. It is true in the algorithm, but our computer knows the conditional distributions. So that's very nice. So it requires knowledge of the conditional distributions of your parameters. And then the theory behind the Gibbs sampler is drawing from conditional distributions will asymptotically converge to the joint distribution. May not, may not make sense yet, but think of the posterior, the joint, density. And we can think of this as like a simple algorithm where we have a mean and a standard deviation, so it's normal. And then for every iteration through, we start with mu, our mean. And then, okay, we draw, uh, so backing up a little bit, so we randomly draw, okay, well, is this posterior higher here? Okay, well, we'll move here. Uh, pretty simple stuff. But then wouldn't it make sense to be conditional on your standard deviation? So those two things, you're iterating through the mu and the standard deviation to find this. And this may not make sense, but it was a general idea. In a continuous case, but let's talk about a discrete case. So on the right side of the screen, we have our conditional distributions. And those are estimating the joint distribution for A and B. So on the bottom table, we have the conditional distribution for P, or probability of B given A. So think of that first cycle where we go through B. Okay, we sampled. Now we're going, uh, we're conditioning on B 
sampling from A, and that's a top uh, chart. And so by using both of those, they should asymptotically estimate our joint posterior of the two parameters. And in this case, it would be A and B. Uh, so there's only four outcomes that we can have. So it could be A0, B0, A1, B0, A0, B1, and A1, B1. And in this case, we just so happen to initialize at A0, B0, but we're conditioning on B. So we're sampling for A now, and we are just at 0, 0. So there's a 20% chance of staying in 0, 0, and there's an 80% chance of moving to 1, 0. So, 80% chance we move to A0, B1. Now, we are conditioning on A because we sampled from A. Now, we're sampling from B given A. So, we have a chance of staying in B0, A, or A1, B0 with a 66 chance or percent chance and a uh, 33 percent chance of moving from a1 to b1 given a so another step it's an a1 b1 now we're conditioning back on b drawing for a so 40 percent chance of staying in a1 b1 60 percent chance of moving to a0 b1 Well, let's just uh, say we uh, sampled many, many times. This is now our joint distribution. So by drawing from our conditional distributions, remember on the first general sl theoretical slide, this is what it'll convert asymptotically converge to. So 30% of the time, King Markov will be in A0, B0. 20% of the time, he'll be in A1, B0, and so on. Funky stuff, but... Someone else proved it. And then just to reiterate, those conditional distributions are estimating that joint distribution of A and B. All right, any questions about that so far? Yes. So when you're doing Bayesian analysis, you can pick any algorithm you want? Yes. So for this example, we used R JAGs, and the default is a Gibbs sampler. I want to say we talked about another algorithm, and I'll point it out to you whenever uh, we get to it. But that is also involved in R JAGs, or can be used in R JAGs. Um, <laughs> And you pre, uh, preceded what I was going to say next, but so here's another algorithm that is nice. I've heard it's uh, more versatile than others because, you know, the conditional distributions you can think of, well, you're going down a diagonal hallway, let's think. Well, you can only move this way, up the diagonal hallway. Well, you're not going to want to do that. <laughs> Just go straight down the hallway. It's diagonal. Let's let's just do that. So here's another algorithm. Um, it's pretty complex, so I put it in very basic terms. Uh, so you would multiply your posterior by the negative log, and it will typically create this bowl shape. And then the sa the sampling technique is like flicking a marble in a random direction for a given duration of time. Well, King Markov is just all powerful that he'll stop, snap his fingers and the marble will stop. So he's given it a duration of time for it to roll. So you may be wondering, okay, well, I would like the, an animation of that. You're in luck. So King Markov flips the marble, lets it roll. Okay, move there. We collect that 
Okay, he fl uh, flicks it again. Clutch that point, but you can see how it went up and then back down. And uh, so the marble, it's kind of like gravity pulling it down back into the bottom of the bowl, or you could think of a skateboarder on a half pipe where it's doing a bunch of crazy tricks. The skateboarder tends to be at the bottom of the bowl because gravity is pulling its, uh, the skateboarder down to the middle of the bowl or the bottom of the bowl. And this is where, oh, yeah, great algorithm, very versatile. R stand, can't download it. So I, uh, yeah. So, uh, but R stand also uh, is another package, sampling package that has other algorithms that you can use in it as well. So, and uh, this one also has a GUI. So if you do get it installed, kind of nice to use. However, good luck installing it again. <laughs> but maybe that's just uh, my personal uh, story of it. But And then uh, I believe this algorithm is in RJAGS and RSTAN. Uh, slice sampling again we can initialize or we can randomly sample where our posterior distribution so think of where the curve is not the x-axis where it's greater than zero so there's some probability greater than zero and x zero is right there well now we can draw a line and randomly sample along that vertical line there. And it's between our x-axis zero, where x zero is, and then maximize at the function or our posterior distribution. So we randomly sample on that. And y is our, our value from that. Now we can draw a line segment with a width of w and the value of y is contained in that uh, width. But on the next sub bullet, you can see, oh, both ends of it have to be greater than our posterior distribution. So our w sub r is above the posterior distribution now. So that side is good. But now we have to extend the line segment. Uh, I got a comment, slice sampling is also available in MATLAB. So that's that's cool, I didn't know that. But now uh, we have to extend the line segment by that length w that we specified on the left side because it doesn't satisfy that uh, above condition. Well, you can see we had to extend it twice for it to get above the posterior on both sides now. Okay, does that make sense? I don't need to point it out or anything? Okay. So, now that we have WL and WR above it, we can randomly sample across this entire line segment. Well, here's the unfortunate thing. We can still sample where it's above the posterior distribution. Well, now we cut off that entire line segment at where we uh, randomly sampled from. So now W becomes shorter. And then if we satisfy that it's below the posterior distribution, that now becomes, sorry, I missed that step where we cut it off. Now that becomes, so X1 became uh, that randomly sampled value from the smaller W. And then we're now continuing the algorithm with Y again, where we draw a line. So again, Another interactive portion. Step one, we chose x sub zero, where the posterior distribution was above zero. What is the next step? Yes, yep, plot a vertical line. And what's the next step after that? Yes, randomly sample for a dot. That's our Y. All right. What's after this? We specified a W. What do we do now? 
Yes. Yes. Very good. I was going to add that, but you got it. All right. Well, both, side, both endpoints aren't above the posterior distribution. What do we do now? Extend it. By how much? And on which side? Yes. So we would extend it by W on the left side. Well, it's not above it. We got to extend it again. Now we cut it off because we randomly sampled on W. Makes the W shorter. And you may be wondering, okay, well, what if I pick too big or too small of a W? You're good. It's robust. It may just take a little bit longer. And then that's the next step. And now we're back to drawing another value. So we reviewed some of the common MCMC algorithms or approaches. So Metropolis Hastings was the same exact one that we talked about for King Markov, where we draw from post uh, proposal distribution, we calculate a ratio uh, for the acceptance probability between the proposed and current location. And then this is found in the Metropolis R package. Gibbs sampling, this is what we used in R JAGS in R, but it requires R JAGS to be installed. And then this is the one where you sample in one parameter where it's conditional on all other others. So and the one I just talked about, we had two parameters. We'll think about like maybe five parameters where it's going to be conditional on the four other parameters, and you're drawing from that leftover one. And then the Hamiltonian mark. Uh, Monte Carlo, the marble flicker, uh, the distributions transform into a bowl. King Markov stops it after a period of time. This is an R stand package that's the default, and it requires the installation of the software. And then size sampling, uh, it's an iterative algorithm that adjusts step size where W is uh, robust, and it's found in R JAGS not used as much in other uh, packages, I'll call it, or softwares. Yes? Uh, unless, you're, unless you have a conjugate pair, are you, are you leveraging con conjugate pairs, you're going to want to use Monte Carlo in some way to um, get your probability for um, using Bayesian methods. I wouldn't say that's like the end all be all, it's just more versatile. Um, so let me think about. And you don't, uh, when you sample, it doesn't have to be, uh, in terms of efficiency for the computer, you can use conjugate prepares, but you're not restricted to it. It just makes that, you know, the number of samples that you're drawing smaller. However, Maybe your conjugate pair, so maybe your beta wasn't representative or what the SME may have thought was uh, good enough, I'll say, or appropriate. So that's just another uh, tidbit off of that. Uh, but And then the Gibbs sampler is referring to, when I talked about that hallway, um, it, so we could think of the hallway as like the parameters being correlated, so you tend to be down here, that's where the algorithm struggles. So I may have mucked that up, but. Yeah, quick question um, from the chat. So Arthur asks, how do you choose the algorithm and how sensitive um, are the results to that choice? Uh, I, so I may have answered most of this on the last question, but our JAGS does a pretty good job. I mean, what you're limited to in my case, I could only install our JAGS and then I, hey, if I didn't like the diagnos diagnostics that were coming out, I'd probably do more of like changing the iterates, changing the burn ins, changing the initialization rather than like maybe completely switching to another algorithm. And then what was the second part of that question? Sorry. Um, and then the are, are the results sensitive to algorithm choice? Uh, no, they'll estimate approximately the same thing. The only danger is if you have correlated parameters for a Gibbs sampler, it'll just take longer, maybe infinitely longer if they're perfectly correlated. 
So we talked about the algorithms and we did a basic example in our JAGS. Now let's talk uh, diagnostics. So we're familiar with trace plots uh, and trace plots illustrate where the MCMC algorithm is explored. And I pointed out uh, individual change should look like this. So I'll add something. In our example with just a coin toss, we use one King Markov per se to explore the posterior. But it's possible to use Prince Martin Markov, I guess, and Queen Markov to explore the posterior or the islands as well, because uh, the kingdom loved them as well. So you could think of that like, so chain one. So the top left chart has that fuzzy caterpillar look to it that like. And well now chain two, what does that kind of look like? I talked about maybe a burn-in and the number of iterates. What could we potentially do there? And the number of iterates, what could we potentially do there? Exactly. So chain two, it just so happened that there was a long burn-in period, so we should probably chop off where it does this to then cut it off right there where it does a fuzzy caterpillar because we know it's sampling from a posterior at that point. And then chain three, uh, that's a difficult question and problem to solve. I think this is going back to maybe, well, which algorithm would you use? Uh, chain three is a nightmare. So if you see that, uh, I don't know, you did something wrong or you uh, should probably reparameterize to make it the model or the posterior simpler. And then on the right, we again see the trace of a mu and sigma, and there's also the density. So those go hand in hand. So you'll see the trace plot and the density plots side by side in our JAGs. Can you comment on burn-in again? Yeah, so burn-in is just the number of, uh, going back to the King Markov example, well, he starts on island two, and he's, uh, but we want to have a burn-in where it gives him a chance to explore the entire kingdom, where it's representative of the true proportion of the times he should be in those islands, remember. So after like 100 days, it got relatively close to what it should be. So we should probably stop there in our King Markov example of the islands. Did that answer it? So it's just giving our uh, our algorithm a chance to explore it before it like goes exploring outside of it. So, so it gives it a chance to get inside the posterior to sample from. All right, and then the next diagnostic is an autocorrelation function plot. ACF plots show the dependence of the sample on previous iterations of the MCMC. And on the x-axis, there's something called lag. Well, that's essentially just saying uh, where you see it, the top left chart, there's little, I'll call them blips. That's essentially saying, well, about 100 out, it's no longer dependent anymore. So we should probably thin the algorithm for every 100 uh, samples. So remember that thin surprise in uh, our simple example? That's what we would change, so thin equaling one to 100 now. So the top left is good. Chain two or the middle left graph, it's got severe dependence. However, it could be misleading because if you look at the x-axis on, it's like 100 for independent samples now, there's just a longer burn-in and then it like flattens out. So maybe you want to thin, or I shouldn't say Brennan, you maybe want to thin out your algorithm every uh, like 1400. And then uh, where the bottom left one gets in trouble is it starts to increase after it converged onto uh, zero correlation, uh, as you can see at the tail end of the right. 
So your your ACF plot should look like the top chart where it's centered around zero and it the lag decreases quickly. Or your correlation drops quickly for a respective lag. And uh, effective sample size, so you can relate it back to ACF or you could kind of subtract out a correlation. Um, it's the number of independent samples we have for the parameter. And an example from our output where I use two chains rather than one is well, for the first chain, we had an effective sample size of about 6,500, and our second chain had an sa uh, effective sample size of 6,100, which to me, this diagnostic in practicality, you'd like to see it closer to the number of iterates, but even in a simple example, it didn't, it wasn't like 90% of the iterates, it was still like 60% because we iterated 10,000 times. So Again, this is just one diagnostic out of many that you can look at. So I wouldn't be too concerned at looking at this one diagnostic. Oh, it's not doing well. So we got to just discredit it totally. That's not the case. And then another diagnostic is the Gelman Rubin statistic. And it's a factor of scale reduction if the simulation continued to infinity. So if we let the algorithm run forever, And it's a diagnostic that attempts to flag situations where the MCMC has failed to converge. It's not saying that it has converged. That's a, there's an important distinction there uh, because people, uh, well, the, it was an article added to uh, Dr. Gelman's uh, statistical website where, hey, we may have ruined our hat. This was just a tidbit that I grabbed out of it. So it's just attempting to flag the situation where it's failed to converge, not that it has converged, because if you're closer to one, it's the better. So that's the scale factor reduction that you would have if you continued to simulate it infinitely. Well, if it's one, you can't, can't reduce the scale anymore. So, and then just another example, um, with the two chains example in our coin flipping, we have a R hat of one. So both chains, and what does that mean in a two chains example? It just means that both chains were exploring the same posterior at, at, the, sim, uh, at the appropriate areas, I should say. All right, any question about the diagnostics? All right, so this slide should look familiar, but this, these are just all the model parameters and the priors that were uh, we selected. And remember, we have our baseline and we have a prior on it of 400 miles. And I forget what the variance was, but 10,000, let's just say. And then we input all these priors into the RJAGS code. And now we're actually doing the analysis for this example that we've been talking about since slide 15 and 16, or 15. So if you remember, it's uh, test or analyzing the driving range or the mean number of driving miles for the new EV tank. And we have that requirement of 475 miles on a single charge, and the design is 80 runs. Uh, we'll switch over at this point. 
so. Uh, our threshold value is 475, so we're going to specify that beforehand to make uh, calculating a probability of, of being above that requirement easier. And then we're going to follow the same uh, seven steps of a sampler setup. So you're uh, setting up your libraries and your work directories and defining your iterates and burn in. So there's the libraries, the number of burn it or iterates. And then the burn in is 3000. Could have done uh, larger, but number of iterates and burn in. But since it's such a complex model, we just need a good quick tutorial. So we're, if we wanted a better estimate, I'd spend a lot more uh, iterates and computer resources to get one. So now we uh, did step one. Uh, in the file that should have been sent to you guys, there's like a CSV file of this experimental data that we collected from the EV uh, effectiveness example. And to read that in, we use this read.csv function in R. And then I don't have the CSV readily available, so, but to make sure it sounds right, it looks good in uh, my opinion. So uh, what this means is the first, or the, on the one charge, we drove 478 miles and we had that baseline and we, so the baseline's always built in, if you remember from uh, Corey's module. However, we're changing the levels on Omega-2, which I have, so Omega-2 was moderate wind, Gamma-2 was uh, paved terrain type, and then Delta-2 was uh, light payload. So that's just all that uh, the data file is reading. Uh, in order to do Bayesian analysis with our JAGs, we have to create matrices and um, data data sets, I'm gonna say, within R. I can't think of the, the correct term for it, but in order to do it, we have to subset it as a, a matrix now from the data read-in. So now we have our design matrix, the ones and zeros for the baseline and all the other parameters. And then our response is that Y value you saw in the header. And the number of observations, this is important because this is our test run size. And we can do that by using N row and R. So we didn't have to remember it was 80 runs. Now moving on to step three, you may be wondering, okay, why is there only two parameters now? Beta and tau? Well, you can uh, run a for loop through the betas, where now you don't have to write every single parameter of your omegas, your gammas, your deltas, and betas. You can, all, you can monitor them um, all under beta. And then tau is uh, the reciprocal of variance. And Bayesians tend to use tau because it's nicer for uh, presenting and doing the math. Uh, so just think of it as a reciprocal of the variance. And then defining the data. Now in the first example, I set an initialization at 0.5. Well, now I have three chains that I need to initialize for every one of the parameters. So what this is saying is I'm initializing for the eta or the baseline at 400 miles. And then I set it to the prior point estimates uh, for the other betas respective to that table we just saw. And then this function rep zero comma six is just saying, hey, we centered all the interaction effects to be at zero for the prior. So that's all that this is doing and then interpret the other two chains as you wish. And then defining the model for the analysis. So now we're translating it for bugs to communicate for it to send us back information. 
So we have to do this model string and then uh, you can see here's our likelihood where y uh, we're assuming comes from a normal distribution. So with mu, i, and uh, with tau as our standard deviation. But this mu i is essentially, remember your design matrix? It's just all that stuff being multiplied for you to get estimates out in your model. So that's all that mu i is. And then I defined or commented what each of those parameters are. So tau is the inverse of the variance and beta one is our baseline and so on. So now we've defined the model for bugs to run and give us back results. But now we have to create that object and then sample from it. That's all that this is doing. And it may take a second for it to initialize because it's a more complex model. Is anyone running this in, uh, at their desk? Too fast to get, am I going too fast or are you able to follow along? Okay. So now it's sampling that 13,000 iterates and with 3,000 of burn in. Okay, and now we're done with the sampler. Just specifying we want more scientific or more digits. And then here's a summary of our uh, sampler object. And you can see that these are all the point estimates for each of those model terms. So beta one was our baseline. And we set a prior for it to be at 400, 355, we're pretty close. And then beta two, it's positively increasing the number of miles on a single charge. And then beta four was negative six, so it's negatively increasing or negatively affecting the performance of the EV on a single charge. And then you can see also with the naive SE and time series SE, it's not close to our standard deviation at all. So the sampler did a pretty good job. And then tau, reciprocal of the variance. So at the end, we'll compute the reciprocal to see what its trace plot and density plot looks like in its actual estimate, or not this 0 0.0004. But looking at each of the trace plots for most of the parameters, give it a second. Now you can see the different colored uh, caterpillars. So they all have a fuzzy caterpillar. Good job, King Markov. And then you can see also in the density plot it's centered around uh, iteration should be on this axis right here. This is where the algorithm was sampling from. So it's centered around above, slightly above 350 miles. And then we can check more of them. This is the only other one I'm checking, but we can just look at the diagnostics. And then uh, alpha two's trace plot, all of the chains have a fuzzy caterpillar, none of them are drifting away. Looks good. And then there's the density centered around 52, which is what we saw back in uh, the object summary. Um, right here, I thought. I don't know why that's not matching up. And then uh, to compute the effective sample size, we use the lapply function, and we can get the effective sa uh, sample size for each chain and parameter for the respective chain. 
So for chain one, we have an effective sample size of 500 for the baseline. And then you may have remembered me commenting on effective sample size of, hey, it looks terrible. We're not gonna, we're not gonna die on effective sample size. So all the other diagnostics are looking good. So I don't think there's any concern on these effective sample size being so well. And then the Gelman, Ru Gelman Rubin statistic or the R hat or hey, the diagnostic that attempts to flag where it may have not have converged. We're looking pretty good. They're all centered around, or they all have a R hat of one. And then to do the ACF plots, we have to manipulate it from an object in CODA, I want to say, to now a matrix in R, and then matrix to the data frame. Uh, you can't just simply go from the, sim, uh, the sampler to the data frame because uh, RJAGs can't read it that way. And then here's some ACF plots. And you can see the lag looks pretty good. Uh, it decreases rather quickly. Now, not to bore you to death anymore with diagnostics, we're going to conduct inference. And again, you would have to uh, set this up as a as dot matrix, and then again through an as dot data frame. But since we already do that, we can skip that step, and we can compute. From the um, chat, can you please go over the effective sample size again? Uh, so practically, I'm not gonna. I, so the, the bigger it is, the better. But again, it's kind of misleading because remember our simple example, we ran 10,000 iterates and we only had an effective sample size of 6,000. So to me, it's like, eh, whatever. It's just one diagnostic. As long as it's sufficiently large, there's different criteria that you'll read in every book. So I didn't want to cement myself uh, myself in a place on relying on this book versus another. And then more descriptive statistics. Uh, essentially, th this is all the information that we got previously, but now we may uh, want to separate it by point estimates, which is the means of the posterior distributions, and we want to look at the standard deviations we could run the code, uh, just means and look at them and then standard deviations and look at it. But in order to find the fitted values, we can run this C bind with means and standard deviations and then see what the fitted values are. And this should look similar from our previous summary object. And then converting tau into a variance that we can understand, I guess, is the reciprocal, what's the mean, and what's the variance. So the variance for the system is 2,500 miles. That's a pretty large variance. And then to conduct and look at posterior probabilities and stuff like that. We are now gonna induce a grand mean on the posterior distribution. So uh, by doing this, we're assuming that each of our likely our factor levels are equally likely. We're able to randomize in our playground as a wind tunnel, but we can't. We just so happen to run enough where the temperature equally like was it uh, was equally likely on both sides of it. And then all that. And now, what is our mean? So if you remember our threshold value, what was it? How many miles? Correct. And letting the computer eventually run, it'll 
maybe, eventually. Is the plot included in your slides, Corey? In case this may run longer. Okay. Well, since this is running uh, longer than anticipated, you'll see what these plots look like in the next module. Um, oh, so the grand mean is, or the mean for the estimate for the grand mean is 487. Well, what does that look like? Remember, our threshold was 475. What's our posterior look like? That's where our estimate is and our threshold, we can uh, put that in the plot as well. And you can see it's in the lower left tail of the, uh, the induced posterior distribution on the grand mean. So what does that mean? We can say something about the probability now. And what is that probability of it being above this threshold? 98.4%. So now you have an intuitive interpretation that I was talking about from module one now actually being used. So rather than talking about the variances and, oh, uh, well, it could be this or in the mean of, no, now we have a probability that we can talk about for a grand mean or, or a probability of it being above a threshold. So this is just, uh, I didn't show this slide, but this is essentially all I did in the code. We can interpret the mean as a grand mean, and our goal is to evaluate this requirement probabilistically. And the math notation, well, what did we find out? We had a 98.4% chance of being above that threshold. So if you're a program manager, what are you thinking? In terms of just inference on the grand mean. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. All right, I got a few thumbs up. All right. So questions for managers to ask about approaches. Do you want to go ahead? I wanted to ask about the, the weights. Um, like, what are those? I was confused. About yeah, that. so we have to specify that to create that list and calculate the grand mean. Because we could also go for the weighted mean approach. So that little snippet of code is complex because we're assuming it was all equally likely, but are we sure that weather and it's nice and sunny out is equally likely as it being rainy and windy and all that stuff? So that's all that the code was doing is we just assumed it was equally likely there to induce a grand or a posterior distribution on the grand mean. All right, so questions for managers that ask about approaches. Was a posterior obtained through a numerical approximation? If so, which? There's four that you guys know now. And then is the code available? Because if it's not, I don't know. And then did the posterior differ greatly from the prior? So we talked about sensitivity analysis of looking at a reference prior or uninformative prior compared to what you have for a prior compared to your post, your new posterior. And then uh, some key questions. What is the purpose of an MCMC in Bayesian analysis? And the, uh, the hint is the big kahuna. Yes, exactly. So the sample from the posterior distribution. What sampling algorithm does RJAGS use? Someone else, you're, you're on fire. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So it, its default is the Gibbs sampler, but there are other options available. 
And then what are some diagnostics for an MCMC? So we, I had said list three, there was four of them I talked about in the slides, and what are they measuring? So I'm gonna say R hat, what is that attempting to do? Yes, so it attempts to flag, uh, it's a diagnostic that attempts to flag where chains may have not have converged. Not that it absolutely has converged, just may have not have converged. All right. Uh, let me try and think of another one. Trace plots, what do they, those do? Think King Markov and his uh, journey around the islands. Yes. Yep, yep. So those are two. Uh, that's more of a practical, and then that's like the theoretical. So uh, the two answers were it shows like the history of where King Markov or a sampler have been, and then uh, another use of it or the practical use of it is, hey, is it in a steady state or is it actually or sampling from our posterior distribution now? So the fuzzy caterpillar. Anyone else? Another diagnostic? We're not going to talk about effective sample size. So another one. The autocorrelation function plots, the ACF plots. So that's just measuring the correlation or the dependence on the number of samples behind. That's where the lag and the correlation come in. Final modules, posterior analysis. Uh, any questions? before we get started on posterior analysis. No, okay, we've made it, last module. So what are our objectives here? We wanna identify Bayesian inference techniques. Uh, we wanna apply a credible interval. We're gonna interpret a Bayesian factor, or Bayes factor, and then we're gonna describe a Bayesian hypothesis test. So we had this earlier. We talked about some differences between the frequentists and the Bayesians uh, in the terms of inference. So when we're looking at inference here, for our point estimates, we're looking for maps, uh, maximum A, that word, that's the tough one, posterior, something like that. Interval estimation, credible, highest density intervals, uh, hypothesis testing, probability, and Bayes factors. All right. So we'll go through each one of those and see how we use that type of inference. First is our map, okay, so this is the mean. The mean is just the average value that we expect to obtain from our posterior distribution. All right, so we looked at that before with our grand mean. So we created our posterior distribution using uh, MCMC technique. We have that posterior, now we just calculate the mean out of that. All right, so that's gonna be one over B uh, of the sum of our theta, our ith draws. Right? And it gives us a mean, similar to what we were doing before in a frequent setting. Now we're just doing it from the posterior. Our credible interval is gonna be a 100 times one minus alpha percent. So similar idea as a confidence interval. A uh, credible interval is an interval such that the posterior probability that theta is contained in the interval is one minus alpha. And so we're talking directly the probability that it's contained in the interval. A lot of people like to talk about confidence intervals in that way, but it's incorrect, right? Confidence interval is over a long duration. If we did it 100 times, 95% confident, we'd expect 95% of those intervals to capture that parameter. This is saying what's the probability that the interval or the parameter is in that interval. All right. So we often do a 95% uh, and we can say there's a 95% chance that the parameter lies within that given interval. All right, so we had our model from before and our system effectiveness example. And so we have uh, estimates for each of our factors. Okay, so we see that, that's our mean. That's the estimate for the factor. Uh, we also have an estimate for the noise, our standard deviation. And then associated with, we have a 95% credible interval. All right, so if we're looking at uh, the first one here, our baseline, right? That was our model with everything at that first level. We're saying that 95% chance that the mean is between 317 and 391. 
That's how we generally like to talk about uh, our results. So it's useful in this Bayesian context that we can actually use it that way. Um, that's one of those big benefits of why might you use non-informative priors rather than a frequentist method, right? You get this interpretation. So one to look at here, right? If we're looking at our temperature moderate, so this third one down, we have an interval that's negative to positive, right? So when we're thinking about slope, we're thinking what's the change in our response for one unit change in that factor? So now slope is a little bit hard to interpret, right? We're saying, well, sometimes if you increase it or change to that level, it's negative, has a negative effect. Other times it has a positive effect. Intuitively, that doesn't really make sense, right? We, we generally think, well, if I'm going to change something, it's going to have a direct effect on that response. When we see something like this in a frequentist framework, what we usually say, right, is it contains zero, so that factor is insignificant, so we don't include it in our model. Under the Bayesian context, we don't have significance. That concept doesn't exist. We're not saying a factor is significant or not significant. We're saying this is the distribution associated with that parameter. So we're drawing from that distribution. So we're not reducing our model in the same sense that we do with the frequentist, where if we see this negative to positive interval, we're going to remove that term. We don't do that here. Right, we leave it in. So all right, Bayesian is just another tool in our tool belt. It is not always the answer. Um, if we're looking for something like screening, right, we maybe don't want to use Bayesian. Uh, we have a lot of factors. We're trying to get rid of some of those factors so we can do smaller tests down the line. Uh, maybe Bayesian is not the approach we want to go for that test. So there are some drawbacks to this, uh, but in general, it's going to give us better predictions. We are now including the distribution of all these parameters, so our predictions are going to be better than they would be under that frequentist framework. Question? So on this uh, credible interval, the 95%, yep. is that under the assumption that your prior model is Valorant, because as you said, the contractor or someone could choose a prior model that outweighs the data collected. Mm -hmm. So when you do the analysis on the credible <laughs> interval based on the prior, does that, what impact does that have? Yeah, so it does include the prior and what you've picked as the prior, but it is not assuming uh, that the prior is correct or incorrect because we, we don't talk in that same way philosophically in revision. We're not trying to say that uh, one thing is right or wrong. We're including the information that we had, and we're adding what we got with our data onto that to create a posterior, which we're drawing all of our credible intervals from that posterior. So you could influence with a certain type of prior. Um, if you've generated that prior in the incorrect way, then your credible interval is not going to be correct, right? It's going to be biased in some sense. So you still need to make sure that that prior selection is good in order to get good credible intervals. Okay. Other questions? So your column of means here mm -hmm. to a frequentist, would they be looking at this like their effects? Yeah. So are means near zero, small effects? Yes. Okay. Is there ever any reduction in the model here where people reduce things? You could, based off of effect size, um, it, you, can, you can do that. Generally, we don't reduce here because we're not talking significance or not significant. Um, we're just generally using this for prediction. And in that case, we can include all the information. It's not going to hurt us to have more of those terms in there because we have distributions associated with each of them. So in the other direction, could you have much higher order terms in here? Mm -hmm. And would they potentially be beneficial? And how would you know if they were or were not? Yep, you could. Um, you could just look at the effect size. Uh, I think generally we'll still use the same principles as DOE, like sparsity of effects. Uh, we're unlikely to see these higher order terms have a large effect, so we don't usually include them. Um, you, you can include them, though. It would work the same. Well, I'm looking for sort of guidance here on it sort of sounds on the one hand you wouldn't remove terms mm -hmm. with the model you're showing us but you wouldn't include these other terms. So is there, is there guidance here on term elimination, keeping? Uh, there is some. We don't really get into you know, keeping terms or not in, in this class. Um, 
I think generally it's main effects, two factor interactions are really as high as we go just from sparsity effects. Uh, three factor interactions, if we know maybe there is some physics based reason to include it. Uh, we're not reducing here because we aren't, the concept of significance doesn't really exist philosophically. But it seems like you're very interested in prediction. Mm -hmm. So from a, a predictive model point of view, when you talk second order, would you frequently keep squared terms? Because if you don't, aren't all the answers in corners of the space if you only have two-factor interactions? So you can have squared terms. Um, I would say it really goes back to the same idea as when developing a DOE, we're trying to say, well, what do we think is gonna matter? We wanna, we wanna guess at what that model is before we develop our test design, right? And so if we have that full model and we say, well, we think these quadratics could play a role, we would include them in here and we wouldn't take them out even if their effect size was small. Now you can do it based off effect size and say, well, if anything effect size is less than you know, 0.1, I'm gonna get rid of it because that essentially adds nothing to my model. I guess my bias is if you, if you put the squared terms in the model, your design's gonna have mid-levels. So if yep. curvature exists, you can see it. Yep. If you don't put it in, your data set may not have midpoints, and then you never know. I agree, yes. Okay. Yeah, so you wanna include them. If you think that they could at all play a role, you would want to include that so you have midpoints in your design. <clears throat> Other questions? Nope, okay. Okay, our posterior probability. Um, Corey shows you how to generate that graph, and he said, well, what's the probability that it's above that 475? That's our posterior probability. Right? The probability it's above or below some value um, that our parameter is taking on there. So in this case, we were looking at a requirement at greater than 475, so we can make that calculation. That shaded in region is the probability. All right, so it gives us a direct way to say the probability that it has met this requirement is this value. So you know exactly how much risk there is, right? Say, say it's 95%, then 5% chance that it hasn't met the requirement, you know exactly how much risk there is, right? 95%, I'm right, 5%, it hasn't met it. So an example of a hypothesis test. Okay, we are having trouble with staff not completing their annual fire extinguisher training. We wanna compare sending the original email, so this is what email we were sending before, variant A, to a new variant of the email that shows an image of a puppy about to be caught on fire to determine which email results in more participants. Right? Only monsters wouldn't do their fire training if they were gonna kill a puppy. So we think, well, now more people will do it. So we're gonna send each variant of this email to 150 participants, and we're measure the percent of participants that complete their annual training. All right, so we have to pick a prior. Um, from our previous email attempts, so we had sent variant A email types before, and from those previous attempts, uh, we expect the training is around 30%. So we're gonna use a beta 3.7 here, right? That's for 30%, three out of 10. And then what property of the beta makes it a good decision for a percentage? If we're looking at this graph, why might we like that distribution for a percentage? Any guess? Exactly, from zero to one. So it's a distribution that has the bounds of our parameter. And so it gives us some information on that. So we like that. So now we collect the data. Okay, so we send out the emails. Variant A, 36 people complete the email, or complete the training based off the email, which is a rate of 0.24. And then variant B, 50 people complete it, which is a rate of 0.33. We still have 100 monsters. So our data will be modeled as a beta. Variant A is gonna be a beta 36114. So all we're doing for that beta is write the number of complete and the number of incomplete. Those are gonna be our parameters for our beta. And then variant B is gonna be 50 and 100. So how do we get our posterior? Well, we could use numerical approximation, right? We could use JAGS, any of those samplers we just talked about. Or we know this is a conjugate. Right, because it's a conjugate, we know that if our prior is a beta, our posterior is gonna be a beta, and we can use that formula right there to generate those values. And so what that looks like is right here. So this is our posterior for variant A and variant B. All right, so variant A is this blue one on the left, 
Variant B is the red one. Is B better than A? Raise your hand if you think yes. Is A better than B? It can be a little hard to tell, right? So we do have some overlap in probability where A could be greater than B, right? That area does exist. So what do we do with that? How do we analyze that? Well, we could look at credible intervals. All right, so our variant A mean, the credible interval, is 0.18 to 0.31. And for variant B, the credible interval in our mean is 0.26 to 0.41. Is B better than A? How many people think yes now? Now nobody likes B. This is done. All right. So we all think A is better than B. Well, we have some overlap in our intervals, right? So it can be hard for us to tell. Uh, right here, we're talking directly about probability that it's contained in there, right? The probability that the parameter is contained within 0 0.18 and 0 0.31 for variant A is 95%. We know that. Same for B, right? We know what, what range that falls in. So something else we might look at is saying, well, there's a 30% chance that variant B is below 0.31. So 30% of the time, it's below the highest point of the credible interval for variant A. So not very often. So this is indicating to us that B is in general, right? Generally looks better than A. So we might think B is better. Another option we have, all right, we could do a Monte Carlo simulation to determine in how many worlds is B the better variant. All right, we have a distribution for A, and we have a distribution for B. So let's draw one from A and draw one from B and see is B better. And we just do this a bunch. Right? So we do this 100,000 times. How many times is B better than A? Uh, we determine the number of samples from B that are greater than A, and in this we see 96% of the trials, B is greater than A. What does this sound similar to? Frequentist. Similar to frequentist. The idea exists the same, right? But we're doing this under the Bayesian framework. So it's very similar to a t-test. We're saying, you know, what's the p-value essentially here would be 0 0.04. So we don't talk about p-values in Bayesian, right? Conceptually, we're looking at something similar to a t-test, but now we're looking at these two distributions we've created. So we have these two distributions, and we are sampling from them over and over and over. And this tells us how often is b better than a from just those two distributions. Right? So we can draw our conclusion from that. We could say, well, 96% of the time, b is better than a, so it's more likely that b is better. Right? Any questions there? I have two questions. So, but you look at the, uh, the width of your interval and say, hey, you know, one is really, really wide. So that's probably too bad. So you could look at the width um, as probably a secondary metric. Uh, if you're just trying to say is the mean greater, right, the width won't really tell you that. The width will tell you how much variation I expect. So if you see something that is, uh, has a mean that's higher, but the interval is way wider than a narrow mean, it'd be hard to draw a conclusion on those, right? You could do the same idea here, though. You could sample from both those distributions and see uh, if that induced variance, that greater variance is causing it to be lower most of the time. And the second question, you mentioned conjugate pair. Mm -hmm. So that also assumes something about your likelihood function too, right? Yeah, so we, we had a likelihood um, based off of what type of data we're collecting. And so, yeah, we have a likelihood and a prior that make a conjugate so that we know that the Posterior will be the same distribution type as the prior. Yeah. So just a note, right? Conjugate priors are not the only ones that yield a closed form solution. You can get a closed form solution from a different prior and a likelihood. Um, the conjugate, though, is always going to give you the same distribution type, right? So if it's a if it's a beta prior, it'll give you a beta posterior. So same distribution. Uh, you can always do the math on others and hope for a closed form solution. You might not get one. If you don't, then you use numerical approximation. Other questions? All right, let's keep going. So how much better is variant B? So we say, well, variant B is better. Well, how much better? Um, so from the simulation, we can create a ratio of these values. We can take that sample that we got from B, that sample we got from A, and just divide them. Right? And so that's going to give us a ratio. Out of our 10,000 times, 
uh, we can use the empirical CDF to observe the level of improvement from variant B to A. So that's what we're looking at over here, right? That's how often it's that much better. And here is our cumulative probability on the right. Yeah. So anything greater than one says B is better than A, right? And anything less than one, A is better than B. And you can see how often that occurs, right? That's our Y axis is the cumulative probability. So we can directly find the probability for any of these values of how much better variant B is. Something else we like to do is compare models, right? We have two different models. Um, we have a null and an alternative, and we can write them as such. All right, so this is us just using that Bayes theorem again. We're inputting our, uh, our Bayesian framework in here, and these are our two models. What we wish to calculate uh, is the posterior odds. So that's going to be dividing our posterior probabilities. So on the top, we have uh, the probability of H0 given our data. And then at the bottom, we have H1 given our data. And then we're just dividing those two formulas right there with the P of data canceling out when we divide. What this gives us is our posterior odds equal to our prior odds times our Bayes factor. And Bayes factor is that key piece that we want there. Okay. So what is our Bayes factor? So the Bayes factor is a value comparing the likelihood on two different models. So two competing models used to quantify the support of one model over the other. So saying this model is this many times better than the other. It's this many times more likely to come from that model than this one. All right. Here's a little uh, guide for you on what the base factor means. Um, 1 to exactly 3.2 means not more than a bare mention. 3.2 to 10 means substantial, and so on. It's really your own discretion, right? If you're a program manager and someone says it's three times more likely to come from this model, are you going to say, ah, that's not even worth a mention? Probably not. You want the one that it's more likely to come from, right? So it's really up to you on where you want to make those cutoffs. Uh, you know, to me, five times seems pretty strong, but here they say it's got to be at least ten times. So there are a lot of different tables that look like this with different values. So, you know, you can uh, pick which one you like. All right, so let's look at an example of Bayes factor. So suppose we're going to test a new missile and record the result of a hit or a miss. It's just a binary outcome. So we're going to launch 20 missiles. And of those 20, we observe nine hits. And we're going to look at several different models and determine which one is most likely given our data. And so this is just conceptually what the base factor is. And so what if we want to say it's from the uniform or it's from a binomial? Well, we're going to use the discrete uniform, 0 to 20, right? Equal value across our 20 shots. Or we can use a binomial uh, and say 50% as our, our chance of hitting our chance of success, over 20. So we have these two distributions, right? The uniform is the one on the top, and the binomial is on the bottom. Uh, same scale, just flipped over. So we calculate our Bayes factor. So it's the probability of our data given that model. Um, and so we can calculate here, 0.16 is the probability under the binomial, and 0 0.0476 is the probability under the uniform. So we divide those, and we get 3.36. So what 3.36 tells us is the observed data are 3.36 times more likely under H0 than H1. So under the binomial uh, than the discrete uniform. Any questions? Nope, okay. Let's look at a different example. Now we want to look at a smooth peak versus a binomial. Uh, so two different models here. We're going to do the exact same thing uh, to calculate this base factor. So we're just going to calculate how likely it is under that uh, model. And we get a value, 2.36. And again, 2.36 times more likely under H0 than H1. So this is a direct way for us to compare model likelihood. An alternative definition of our base factor is the factor by which the prior odds between models is updated after observing the data. Okay, so we talked about the posterior odd is equal to the prior odds times the Bayes factor. So here we're saying, well, how much are we updating our prior odd to get the posterior odds? 
That's what we're calling the Bayes factor. Right? It's a way for us to update our belief. A note, be careful when we're talking in terms of odds. Right? They are relative to one another. Odds are not uh, necessarily easy for us to interpret all the time because it's relative to what the other is. And we'll look at an example of that. So in this case, we say the posterior odds, uh, the prior odd was one and the base factor is four. So after observing the data, base factor shows us that H naught is four times as likely. Okay, now we'll look at an example with multiple hypotheses. Question? Yeah, this one is um, from Philip. Uh, he asks, how does the Bayes factor compare with the classic notion of the likelihood ratio? I guess likelihood ratio test. Uh, same idea, right? We want to compare two different likelihoods. Um, in this case, we're looking at observed data and saying how much is it updating our belief. So uh, mathematically similar, but our interpretation is going to be different in what we're getting out of a Bayes factor. Any other questions? Okay. So multiple hypotheses. Um, another example, we're buying dollar scratch off lottery tickets and the card claims that one in two are winners. You think there's no way that there are that many winners and expect one in 20 to be winners. Right? So the null hypothesis, the card tells us, well, it's 50-50, so one out of two, one half, and we're saying ours is one out of 20, so one over 20. So we're going to purchase 100 tickets, and we'll, of those 100 tickets, we observe 24 that won. Okay, so 24 out of 100. Uh, our data comes from a binomial distribution, either a winner or not winner, and it has this form right here. When we're calculating our base factor, um, you'll notice in this form that we had before, right, we have this n choose x, it's going to cancel out. So we don't have to worry about that. And we can calculate our base factor. Right, we're using the 0 0.05 is our 1 in 20, and the 0.5 on the bottom is our 102. Right? So these are two different models, and we're saying how likely is it that our data of 24 out of 100 came from that model. The cards claim that 1 in 2 winners uh, one in two are winners is 653 times more likely than your expectation that one in 20 are winners. Does that make sense? If one in two are winners and we had 100 tickets, how would you expect to win? 50, right? You expect half of them. We saw 24. Yet we're saying it's 653 times more likely from that model. Does that make sense? All right, so think about it this way. The probability of getting 24 or fewer winners, assuming the true probability really is 0.5, is 0 0.00000000009. That's the actual probability of getting what we observed or fewer. Yet we're saying it's 653 times more likely, which makes it seem like a really good model, right? It's 653 times better than the other one. This is where odds are tricky, right? It's relative to each other. The one in two is 653 times more likely, but that's because the one in 20 is really far off, right? So it's all relative to each other. So, well, we want a better alternative. So let's look at that. Well, maybe it's actually closer to one in five. So we can take another alternative. Same thing here. We're going to calculate a Bayes factor. Same exact thing. Um, now we're using 0.2 for our 1 and 5 and 0.5 for our 1 and 2. And we get that the 0.2, so our 1 and 5 model, is 917,399 times more likely. What does 917,000 mean on its own? Nothing really, right? It's all relative to the other model you're comparing to. So be careful with the odds on this one. But it does tell us that this model is much better. Is there a better alternative than 1 and 5? So we could keep doing this, right? We could pick every combination that we want, um, or we can use a computer to just search a sequence of these values, right? So we can ca calculate the binomial for everything between 0 and 1, and it can tell us which is the best one, which is the highest Bayes factor relative to our 1 and 2, right? And that would be our preferred alternative, the most likely outcome. 
Another thing we can do with Bayesian is interim analysis. So we talked about the stopping rule before. Um, under this Bayesian framework, question? Yeah, here. Um, since we were just we were just talking about testing, mm -hmm. uh, so I've got one from Terrell here. He asks, "Is Bayesian hypothesis analysis immune to the multiple comparisons problem?" I think so. I'd have to think on it a little bit more, but I think I think yes, it is immune to that. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm going with for now. <laughs> refer to it as that. Um, the statistical treatment, the standard statistical treatment is named after somebody. I want to say his name starts with a B. Does anyone remember in, in the room? Bonferroni. Bonferroni. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. But I'm going to describe it in terms of the statistical or the physical physics look elsewhere problem. Um, if I have a, a, an experiment that's looking for 3,000 different signals at the same time and each one of those 3,000 signals is, let's say, one-tenth of a percent um, um, likely to actually occur, right? Then on average, I would expect to find three of them, right? Yep. And so the, the point is at that, when, if I found, once I find one, I can't just jump up and say, oh my gosh, so I have like, um, you know, how at whatever level of significance discovery, right? Because I have to take into a, to, to account that although I found one or two or three, I was looking across such a broad phase space that that was in fact in line with expectations, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna lock it in and say that it is immune to that problem because we don't talk about uh, error in that same way, right? It's type one error. Uh, generally, we're doing that family-wise comparison and that's why we have to make the adjustment for all the multiple hypotheses, but we don't have that same concept here. Um, so, yeah, we don't have that same problem. Other questions? All right. So our interim analysis, um, we talked about that we don't have that stopping rule. We can stop at any point, uh, and we can do some analysis based off of that. So uh, we're constantly updating our belief, right? Each new data point that we get is adding information to our posterior. So our posterior is constantly updating. And that's why we don't have to necessarily stop at any given point. We, we're always adding to our belief, right? Our concept here is that we have some belief. The data is just impacting that belief. So, you know, we can stop at any point. Uh, it's not constrained by the test design. Uh, we can use predictive probability to estimate future observations. Um, so what we're talking about there is that we can use some of the information that we already know to draw the future observations and what they might look like, uh, right? We have a distribution on everything. So we can draw from those distributions and say, what might the future observations look like? Um, so if we're stopping early, Maybe instead of just stopping the test, right, we could use some predictive probability to say, well, what are the possibilities what my next observations might look like? And I can say, well, I can fill in the test design with those and see what conclusion I would have drawn. All right, that's a little bit outside scope here, uh, but it is something that we want to consider when we're stopping early. And we can perform analysis after each run um, or after some set of runs. If we have a, a, a system where we have to do 10 runs at a time, or we can do 10 runs, do analysis, 10 runs, analysis, and so on. Right. Yeah. So I'm thinking about problems where you have like very small data sets, right? So you have these big military systems and you only have a few data points. Um, and so if I'm thinking, okay, I could use this to tell me more about the future, right? Um, tell me more about what, what could other things look like, right? Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, how many 
data points would I need to have to be able to confidently do that? Mm -hmm. You know, or would I just need a really good prior, you know, kind of thing? Yeah. So there is a way to do that. Um, it's a pretty long explanation of exactly how to do it, so we could talk afterwards. But you can look at, you know, have I tested enough where all of my future observations, given I'm predicting them, uh, won't change my answer, right? So you get to a point where you're saying, well, whatever I see from here on based on the distributions that I already have is not going to change my answer, so I don't need the rest of the test, right? So that, that's really the point when you would stop. Um, so there are more complex methods that we have to deal with that. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. All right, so some warnings about stopping early. Um, stopping early can allow for a decision based on predetermined expectations. All right, so this is kind of what you're talking about. If we pick a prior that gives us some expectation of what's going to happen, all right, we were under one test point. The analysis says it's what we want, so we just stop right there. We wouldn't ever do that um, because that's just basically us saying our prior is correct. And we don't ever really want to just say that. Um, so what you do pick is your prior can determine uh, the outcome. So you got to be careful on that if you're stopping early. Randomization is an important principle um, in general DOE. So if we're testing and we haven't got a design that's randomized, um, maybe just by accident, we have all of one level of factor, and then we stop early, we're not going to see any of that outcome. Um, so randomization, always something we want to consider with uh, design experiments. It's possible to use a very extreme prior, uh, which indicates we stop early. Right? So uh, the example here that I like is if you're watching a basketball game, right, and it gets to halftime, and all the lights go out, it'd be fair to say, well, we would expect uh, the team that's winning at halftime is the better team, and so that team wins. Versus, I want team B to win, so the second that team B is ahead, I stop the test and they win. That wouldn't be fair. So you got to make sure your stopping rule is fair. And then we include time in the model. All right, think about this. If a contractor delivered a system and claimed they stopped testing early, but their prior was well above the requirements, would you trust their results? Who would trust it? Who doesn't trust contractors no matter what? <laughs> so we might be weary of that type of thing, right? So when we're doing our test, we want to think about that same thing. If somebody else were looking at my analysis, would they agree with my decision to have stopped early? All right, so let's look at um, our system reliability example. So we have a spreadsheet. So everybody should have this spreadsheet. Let's see. All right. Okay, so we have our test. Suppose we wish to test the driving range reliability of the M2A2. Uh, we assume we have a requirement of 80 hours with the threshold and 120 hours as the objective. Our first part of this says, compare the frequentist and Bayesian analysis for the following cases. We're using a prior mean of 95 and a prior standard deviation of 10. So we can input that into our prior right here. Our mean is 95. And our sigma is 10. And over on the right, we can see our prior distribution change. Right? We have our posterior and our prior right there. And we can look at some different values. So first test, we had 250 hours, and we had zero failures. All right. So our Bayes estimate, our peak value, is 96. Our frequentist one doesn't exist. All right, we tested for 250 hours. What's the mean time between failure if we didn't see an observation fail? We don't really know, right? We have this prior belief beforehand that we're now incorporating. 
So we don't even need to see a failure for us to have a reasonable distribution under a Bayesian framework. But let's say we had one failure. All right, so we just change our number of failures there to one. What's that look like? So we can see a little bit of a shift over here in our posterior. It's that light blue. When we had one failure, it shifted over a little bit. And we have our lower bound value for our bays and our lower bound value for our frequentists. So our lower bound value here for base is 81. If our threshold requirement was 80, would we have passed this test? Yes, right? Our, our credible interval is above that value. But under the frequentist setting, right, we only have this value here of 53. It requires more data for us to draw those same conclusions, right? If our prior information is good, right? So another example. Next one, we're going to do 1,000 hours and 10 failures. So a big shift over in our graph here. Blue big shift to the right. Um, our Bayes value, lower bound, is 81. Uh, and our lower bound for our frequentist is 59. So still very differing values. So what we pick as our prior has a big impact on our conclusions here. Uh, this is probably one of the best uses for Bayesian is reliability analysis like this. If we have information from previous tests, um, those tests might not have been specific to get reliability, but we have information on how often it failed. We can use that information to generate a reliability test without having to retest entirely. Usually we don't have enough time to let it fail 100 times, right? And we don't want it to fail 100 times. So we have to do some sort of limited testing. And for that, Bayesian is very useful. Final example here, 3,800, we do a lot of testing, and six failures. Now we have the reverse, right? Our Bayesian says 108, and our frequency says 321. So we have the opposite effect here now, right? Our prior is now keeping our distribution lower rather than letting it pull away, okay? So our prior doesn't necessarily uh, pull it one way or the other. Sometimes it can stop it right, from getting pulled that direction. Any questions on part one? Oh, okay. Part two, um, in the interest of time, we will skip the filling in part. And you probably have an instructor copy that is filled in already. Um, we can open that one. And it's this table right here. All right, so we're looking at analysis. With 10 failures, right? our frequentist approach says we want to wait until there's 10 failures. Now we have a few different priors. Right? So we have a prior 9510, a prior 9520, and a prior 8020. Let's say that we want uh, to stop early. Okay, and under our Bayesian stopping rule that we, we have created, we're going to say it has to be above the threshold two failures in a row for us to stop early. If it is, we think then we have a good estimate and we don't need to keep going. All right, under the frequencies framework, these are the values that we get right here, okay? We have to do all 10, right? That's what the frequency says, we have to do them all. That's the test we designed for, so that's the test we run. And at the end, we get a lower bound of 90. So at the end, we say the system has met the requirement. What about this one? What should we do here? If our prior is 9510, what should we do? Do we test all 10? Who wants to test all 10? Nobody. Who wants to test four? No one wants to test four? You sure? What's our stopping rule? What do we say for Bayesian? If it's above the threshold twice in a row, we're going to stop. Right? Our threshold was 80. So I test it once. My lower bound is 79. I haven't met the threshold. I keep testing. Test it again. Still 79. Haven't met the threshold. I keep testing. I do it again. Now my lower bound is 81. 
Okay, I've met my requirement now. That's one time in a row. But just doing it once maybe isn't enough for me because it could go back down on the next one. So I want to do it twice in a row. So I test again. Now it's 82. That's my lower bound. So I can stop right there. All right, so I only have to do four tests. If this is my prior and 80 is my threshold, I only have to test four instead of 10. My conclusion here is that I've met requirements. My conclusion under the frequentist framework was that I met requirements. Same conclusion, right? Over half less tests. All right, now 9520. When do I stop? Six. Six, exactly. We've reached 80 twice in a row, so we're going to stop after six. So this is sort of our sensitivity analysis here, right? Maybe prior one was the prior we stuck with. That's the one that we got from our SME. That's the one we like. So we're doing sensitivity analysis. What if I had picked a higher sigma? Would I have drawn the same conclusion? Yes, right? I would have said that it met requirements. Now let's pick a very different prior. This one's going to be an 80-20. All right, so what we've done now is really shift that mean. Before, we were expecting a high mean. We said it's going to start at 95. So we were pretty optimistic that it was above that 80 point. Now we're saying, well, let's put it at 80. All right, that's the mean. So we set it at 80. When can I stop this test? Who says 8? Can we stop at 8? We met the requirement. Right, so we said we had to do it two times in a row. In this case, we draw a different conclusion. Right, we test all ten. That was our frequentist point. Right, we got all all the way to our frequentist design, so we haven't saved any runs. At the end, we draw the conclusion. Well, we haven't met the requirement. So we've drawn a different conclusion than the frequentist framework. And it's because we've picked a prior that is much lower than these other ones. Right, so we've input that sort of belief that it's equally likely to be below 80 as it is above 80. So we got to be careful when we stop if we're doing Bayesian. Right? It doesn't mean as soon as we reach it, we stop always. Uh, in actuality, we would want to do, like you mentioned, some predictive probability type stuff where we assume um, what those future observations might be. And then we're going to say what our conclusion changed based on that, those predictions. Uh, we wouldn't just be as straightforward as, oh, I've met it, I stopped. Right, we usually don't do that. All right. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so th this is a sensitivity analysis and, you know, kind of, sort of, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, I, when I think of doing sensitivity analysis, I, I don't want to see, like, like a swing like that, you know, like I would want it to see, see it to be kind of, you know, stable, you mm -hmm. know, like even if I picked 80, 20, I still would have been yep. fine. So when, when it's like this, what do you conclude? Do you conclude that you need to do all the tests when you see this? Yeah. So this one I would say is not extreme enough of a difference where I would make a different conclusion where I would say that my prior was so wrong, right? You, you're talking about a lower bound of 85 versus 78. So while it is inconvenient that our threshold happens to fall in between there, right? It's not that much of a difference. So I really need to then think, how much do I believe my prior? If that prior was generated with information that I trust, uh, especially if it's like IID data, then I'm happy with that prior. Uh, if it's something where I was like, oh, I don't really know, right? And that prior was kind of made up. We just picked something, right? Which we shouldn't do in the first place. But if we did do that, then you might say, well, now we need to do more data collection because we're not exactly sure. So your sensitivity analysis, if you, if you don't get something that is definitive, usually means I need to test more. Other questions? Okay. We'll go back to the slides. Thank you. All right, questions to ask about analysis. Okay, so how informative is the prior relative to the data? Um, if we do some sensitivity analysis, right, how informative was that prior? Uh, was our data close to the prior? Was it really far away? Uh, how does our analysis relate to a requirement? Uh, 
So what analysis are we giving? Are we doing a hypothesis test? Are we giving a credible interval? Do we want a Bayes factor? Right, it should relate directly to the requirement that we're testing. Was sensitivity analysis done? Right, we always want to do sensitivity analysis. Uh, another option, right, versus doing a different informative prior when doing sensitivity analysis, generally what we do is look at a non-informative prior, uh, see how that non-informative prior looks compared to the prior that we selected. So that's the way we do sensitivity analysis. And then was the test completed or was it stopped early? If it was stopped early, uh, why and what's the justification uh, for that stop? Knowledge check. All right, how do we interpret a base factor of three? All right, so it depends. What we're going to draw as a conclusion of what three means does depend on our own interpretation of how much we think uh, three matters. And when we're talking three interpretation, we mean three times more likely. And if we think three times more likely is significant, then that might be our conclusion. If we think three times more likely doesn't really mean anything, then we say that they're essentially the same, right? All right, what is the name for the intervals generated under a Bayesian framework? Credible, exactly, thank you. And true or false, we can stop at any point during testing without invalidating the results if the intention is to use Bayesian analysis. False? Who thinks false? A few. Who thinks true? Nobody's answering. Come on. <laughs> All right. So it's true. Right? We can stop at any point under a Bayesian, and it's not going to invalidate our results. It might not be a good idea to stop, but mathematically it is going to work. Right? You made it. Module's done. But you're not out yet. All right, so it's the limitations of Bayesian methods. Um, there is no correct way to choose a prior. There is no one prior that is the right answer. Um, we have some tips and general rules we follow when selecting priors, but there is not just the way to select a prior. That can be concerning since a lot of our analysis is based off of that prior. Right? We don't have to worry too much. Our data also plays a role, and so that data will overwhelm our prior eventually either way. If conjugate priors are not used, it is possible there is no mathematical tractability. We might not get something closed form, uh, when we did that simulation, right, we had a posterior distribution with some line. What distribution was that? We don't know, right? Looked kind of normal. Maybe it was, maybe not. So we don't exactly know what that distribution is. So we won't have a closed form solution, and therefore we can't use our properties of distributions that we like to use in the frequentness framework. We can still use numerical approximation, though. Uh, MCMC will provide slightly different answers. Uh, unless the same seed is used. So you could run it multiple times and get slightly different answers. Usually not much of a concern, but uh, you can get different answers, which is not always good. Uh, and then the big limitation to Bayesian is complex math. Uh, it's very difficult to do a lot of this. Uh, you're multiplying that likelihood function by a distribution. Uh, that math is not easy, even for a computer. Sometimes it's very slow, and we can't actually use Bayesian methods uh, to do that interim analysis because it takes so long. And that's one of the benefits that we want to get out of it. Uh, so that complex math does slow us down and is definitely a limitation to these approaches, um, especially finding people that can do it. Right? If you have a test and you want to use Bayesian methods, you got to find the right person to do that. Uh, everyone here obviously can do it, but you know, outside of here, people can't. And so they have to find us to help. Right? Some key takeaways. Bayesian naturally leverages previous, could be dissimilar, information um, to inform current testing. Right? It's going to take that previous information as our belief. We're going to collect some data, and we're going to update that belief to our posterior. There are several types of priors that can be selected. We talked about non-informative. We talked about weekly informative. And we talked about informative priors. Very flexible which ones we can use. Um, we don't want to pick something that we don't have good justification for. Priors are updated across the continuum of testing. Uh, the prior you're using now for this current test will get updated to the posterior 
And then that posterior can become your prior of your next test. So you can keep updating that prior as you keep testing. It aligns with and expands the current process to quantify data for use in operational testing. Right, we can use that information that we have in developmental testing and carry that over into OT. That's what ultimately what we want to do. Um, we want to make sure that our data is not going to waste. Right? We're capturing all of that information and we're using that in our future testing so that we can limit the testing that we have to be doing and so that we can save resources. We can obtain smaller standard deviations around fitted values, um, outperforming frequentist methods under a small sample set. So a lot of our methods are about reducing noise, right? getting smaller deviations around our parameters. Um, the Bayesian methods can give you this result, uh, especially under small sample sizes. It'll work much better than frequentist. Okay. You did it. You made it. Any questions? No? Okay. Well, we appreciate you guys being here. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, you're a great audience. So we'll hang around for a little while if you have questions and want to talk to us. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.